Welcome everyone. This is uh, the uh, Herbert C. Kelman seminar and uh, my name is Donna Hicks. I'm the chair of the seminar. Uh, and I would just like to point out that this is co-sponsored by the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs and the program on negotiation um, at, here at the law school. And also we wanna thank you all so much for, for coming today because I know we've got people from all over the world and it's, gonna, it's just wonderful knowing that all of you are here and um, listening to our wonderful speaker we have today. We just really appreciate that you take the time to, to be with us. So we are thrilled to have uh, our friend, Tim Phillips here with us today. Honestly, Tim and I were talking and we thought we realized that we have known each other for nearly three decades. And we both agreed that we kind of grew up together professionally uh, here in the field of international conflict resolution here at Harvard. So it's just um, it's just wonderful to have Tim here and you're gonna you're gonna love his presentation. And he um, he had, well, wait a minute. So I, let me just tell you a little bit about the format before I introduce Tim. Um, and the format is that we will have Tim present for about 30 minutes, 35 minutes. And then we're going to invite you to um, uh, a Q&A uh, segment. And if you have a question or a comment that you'd like to make, go into the uh, Q&A function and, and post your, your question there. And I will then um, read them to, to Tim as they come in. So I also wanted to tell you that this, is, this session is being recorded. And if for some reason you uh, wanna see it again or uh, some of your colleagues wanna see it, they can go to the Program on Negotiation website in a few days and uh, it'll be posted there and you can, you can take a look. And also I'd like to thank all of our friends at the Program on Negotiation for making this um, seminar possible. Nicole Bryant, James Kerwin, Diane Long, and Anna Chang. Uh, we couldn't do it without them. So thank you. Thank you all for that. And Tim, uh, our friend Tim Phillips is the founder and CEO of Beyond Conflict. Tim is, has led Beyond Conflict in its efforts to help catalyze the peace and reconciliation processes in several nations, including Northern Ireland, El Salvador, Kosovo, and South Africa. He also advised the United Nations, the US Department of State, and the Council of Europe. He serves on the board of directors, trustees, and overseas, overseers of numerous international organizations and cultural educational institutions. He also serves as a strategic consultant to a number of early stage non-governmental organization, organizations on issues of democratization, civil society, conflict resolution, and technologies to bridge the digital divide in the developing world. Tim is a frequent speaker in national and international forums, including the Council on Foreign Relations, the Salzburg Seminars, the US Congress, and the US Department of State. And he's lectured um, at numerous universities, and he, um, including Harvard, Columbia, and, and Brandeis. And he's published uh, on the topic of transitional justice. And in fact, the organization that he now runs used to be called the Project on Transition. Um, the project, wait a second, Tim, sorry. Uh, the project, the project on times of transition. That's what it was. And he was featured on, in the PBS documentary, The Visionaries. And he's also been a guest on uh, National Public Radio, Radio RTE Ireland, and the BBC World Service. So we are just thrilled, uh, Tim, that you're here with us and you're going to be addressing the topic, America at the Crossroads, what we can learn from abroad. And I, I can only uh, tell the people who are listening that you have such extensive experience with this. And I know you're gonna share some profound insights here with us today. So I'm gonna turn it over to you. Uh, well, thank you, Donna. And uh, I wanna thank uh, Herb Kelman, uh, a mentor to both of us. Um, and it's hard to imagine we've been 
friends, uh, not hard to imagine we've been friends, but we've been working together nearly three decades. And, um, and also want to thank uh, the great people at the program on negotiation. So with that, I am going to do something um, called get my slides ready. Give me one second. I think we're there. Yes. Great. All right. Again, I want to thank um, Donna and everybody at the uh, Kelman Seminar in the program of negotiation for this invitation. Um, I remember saying to Donna Hicks uh, a number of years ago um, that when we and others would travel around the world as Americans doing work in different countries, a number of the leaders that I worked with from South Africa to Northern Ireland to pretty much everywhere, the Middle East and Central America, would say to me, it's great you're doing this work around the world, but you need to bring this work home to the United States. Um, sort of like canaries in a coal mine, they could see and sense really long before I did how profoundly off course the United States uh, was heading and frankly has been on many issues for a long period of time. And so um, thanks to the last few years here in the United States, for those of us from the US who worked abroad out of necessity um, we've had to really step back and look at our own country. And so that's sort of the genesis and a little bit of the background that I'll be talking about today. And one of the things I wanna mention uh, just briefly, we're coming up on our 30th anniversary as an organization. As Donna mentioned, we had a very long name uh, before Beyond Conflict. It was called the Project on Justice and Times of Transition, because when we started in 1992 officially, at the end of the Cold War working in Central Eastern Europe, um, I never thought it would be more than the first conference, second conference, third conference, uh, with this idea of bringing together people with firsthand experience uh, to help people imagine what change could look like. And if there's anything that distinguishes beyond conflict approach, it's the power of shared experience, meaning we bring in people at different levels who had been across uh, divides as enemies, as adversaries, who never imagined the change was possible to bring them together with people to show them indeed it was possible, um, that you could model change. It is difficult, but it truly is possible. And we did that through leaders, you know, who were paramilitary guerrilla leaders, civil society or government or military leaders on the other side. And uh, it's been a powerful uh, approach over these 30 years. Uh, and at the core of this um, notion of shared human experience, was also this notion that we're always looking for new models and insights to show people that change is indeed possible while recognizing the difficulty in, in achieving it. Um, I often tell people um, there are no unique conflicts, but every conflict will have its own unique characteristics. And I'll mention how we, about a decade ago, started working with brain and behavioral science. Actually, Donna was one of the first people to get me to really start thinking about this almost 15 years ago. So in many ways, she's been a pioneer, not only in conflict resolution, but bringing science and, and psychology to bear in this field. And so with that background, I wanna talk about a study that we did with colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania over the last two or three years, uh, working with Emile Bruneau, who some of you may know, uh, unfortunately passed away from cancer uh, about six months ago. And he was a close friend and colleague and we started working together to look at how brain and behavioral science could also um, connect with experience and practice and conflict resolution and reconciliation to try to make a really big uh, difference in the world. And working with his colleagues at UPenn, we started looking at the psychology of polarization in the United States. So what I'm gonna go through initially is what we found in this research um, and then how it leads to what we can learn from abroad here in the United States. And the other thing I'll mention is if you go to our website Beyond Conflict, you can see at the top a link to this report called America's Divided Mind. So here's what we looked at. We looked at the psychology of polarization and using the lens that brain and behavioral scientists would bring to that work and ask what is happening to polarization in the United States? And I think everybody on this call will know that polarization is inherent in any society, even in the most robust of democracies. But you know, polarization can also be deeply dangerous and divisive. And so with the team at UPenn, they did a series of national surveys 
and took representative Democrats and Republicans. And here are the highlights of what we found. And again, some of this will not be a surprise. That extreme polarization is threatening American democracy. And if, and if left unaddressed, it will likely damage uh, and permanently damage the trust in American institutions. And if you only look at to what happened on January 6th, um, you know, this is sort of an outdated uh, notion, but you know, deepening polarization uh, is dangerous to American democracy, American institutions, and, and democratic norms. What's happened, we've found, is that the identities Democrat and Republican have sort of aggregated and come together and represent many of the fault lines in this country into one central fault line. And the identities of Democrat and Republican have begun operating not as opposing political parties or views with profound disagreement, but as social identities, similar to the way Israelis and Palestinians or Shia and Sunnis or Catholics and Protestants in Northern Ireland at the height of the conflict viewed each other. It was sectarian, it became tribal, it became an us versus them way of looking at each other. And one of the things we know from brain and behavioral science, when you develop an us versus them tribal view of people across divides, then a whole range of unconscious psychological processes come online to serve, to drive us further apart. And you can just see that happening in this country and many others around the world. So this fundamental divide, this deepening identity-based polarization is eroding Americans' trust in our institutions, in each other. Certainly we've seen our democratic norms violated and eroded and it has heightened the risk of political violence. And to think that when I put these initial slides together six months ago, five months ago, when we released our report, we can now see that political violence has happened. And we start to view um, and question the other side's rationality, their good faith, and their real grasp of reality. So what are some of the characteristics of a polarized psychology? Well, as I mentioned, when you and I become us versus them, a whole range of psychological processes come online. They affect everything from our judgments, our beliefs, our attitudes, and behaviors. Once we divide into groups and outgroups, that psychology drives us further apart. Now, one of the things as a non-scientist I learned years ago, it's really important, the scientists would say to me, to focus on how we think as humans and not just what we think, because how we think is so deeply unconscious. In fact, close to 90% of how we think is below the level of conscious awareness. And our sense of group belonging and identity, which becomes heightened in a deeper, more, more fragmented, polarized society, distorts the way we interpret facts, the information we seek out and the actions we take in response. And again, this most recent election, even the pandemic response um, illustrates that very powerfully. And you know, like Donna and others who have spent years trying to resolve conflict, trying to promote reconciliation, you know, and the beyond conflict approach of shared human experience. So organic to our approach is that people are humans, that they can learn from each other and people can change. And we saw that empirically, but now science is either both reaffirming that, but also giving us insights and hopefully tools to actually address human psychology in ways that are gonna be really important uh, in the coming months and years. So we released this report I mentioned called America's Divided Mind, Understanding the Psychology That Drives Us Apart. And we released it uh, in May of this past year. And I'll just briefly say that one of the things we looked at was big issues like immigration and open borders and gun control. We looked at like and dislike and dehumanization. And the key takeaway, now this is the good news of our increasingly identity-based polarization, is that Americans believe that the party, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, the other side dehumanizes you, dislikes you, and disagrees with you twice as much as they actually do. And what that means is when we looked at um, open borders, we, our researchers would ask Democrats and Republicans, as a Democrat, where are you on open borders, for example? You know, you would have profound, important positions, but there was a lot of people sort of in the middle. And we found the same on the Republican side. But when you would ask a Democrat, where do you think 
Rep Republicans are on the issue of open borders, they would say, oh, they want them completely closed. And when you ask a Republican, what do you think Democrats are on open borders, they would say they want them completely open. And we found that on several issues. Then on like and dislike, how much do you dislike the other side? And then more importantly, how much do you think they dislike you? The number was nearly 50%. And the same on dehumanization. So Emil and our colleagues and, and team over the last several years looked at the psychology of dehumanization and looking at 13 countries around the world where this blatant dehumanization index, a very blunt instrument, when you look at the ascent of man from early primates to humans, and then on a scale of one to 100, you would ask, where would you place this group? Now, it's a very disturbing graph, but dehumanization is a pretty disturbing reality at its worst. And we wanted to understand the blatant aspects of dehumanization. And we found that Democrats and Republicans overestimate, again, nearly half, how much Republicans or Democrats dehumanize the other, each other, I mean, the other side. So if you think the other side dehumanizes you at such a huge level and sees you not only just as a threat, but as not fully evolved as a human, then what do you have in common with this uh, group of people on the other side? So we see this happening, but we also see that it's way, way overestimated. And that's because we get information in silos. We live separate from each other. We literally you know, go to separate social media platforms, read different media outlets, go to almost different churches, communities, and so forth. And so we're living in a series of bubbles that are reinforcing identity-based polarization, that us versus them. And that then leads to what do we as a nation do about this? So I could tell you one of the things that beyond conflict, what we've been doing is testing interventions, which maybe we can describe another opportunity to, to correct these misperceptions that exist. These, what we our scientists call meta misperceptions of the other. And a lot of this will be in the report. But the other thing we can do is tap into our 30 years of firsthand experience working with leaders around the world. Because if there's one thing that happens if you're in South Africa, Northern Ireland, El Salvador, Bosnia, many other countries around the world, there are leaders trying to deal with a us versus them identity-based mindset that brought them to conflict in the first place. And so it makes total sense as Americans to go abroad to say, what can we learn? And a lot of those insights, um, while they make rational sense, are emotionally very difficult. And one of the things I've found as an American who has spent you know, my entire career traveling around the world and trying to encourage people to make peace with their enemies, to sit down with people who did really horrible things. Or as a colleague of mine said about you know, Bosnia after the Dayton Peace Accords, trying to tell Bosnian Muslim communities to go back to Srebrenica in the service of reconciliation and live in a community near the people that killed your family members. It's much easier to do that from a safe emotional distance. And I came to realize that as an American, I was at a very safe emotional distance. The more I started seeing what was happening in this country, our country, my country, and really realized the privilege I had. And this work is really difficult. So what are some of the key things I wanted to share today that I learned? We need to understand the nature of the challenge. What is the nature of the conflict we are in? And what is it we are trying to address? And I think for me, one of the most important things is, are we trying to resolve a violent conflict or transform a society? So we've heard a lot of people talk since Joe Biden's uh, inauguration about his call for unity. And I think it's really important uh, to think about conflict resolution and conflict transformation. In my experience, in my view, and, and some others, is that conflict resolution requires unity. So when you think of the Dayton Peace Accords that ended the Balkan War, or if you think of the Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland, you had violence over, in some cases, decades, people dying, disappeared, in some cases, ethnic cleansing or genocide. And there was a push from the international community and others to resolve that conflict. And that required, as you see in this image, people literally across these tables, unifying in the service of ending violence ending conflict. 
It's almost like dealing with that triage. So that conflict resolution does require, in a sense, a focus on unity for the purpose of that agreement. But to transform a society requires clarity. And I think it's really important distinction between unity and clarity. Because in clarity, you have to deal with some profound realities, narratives, and truths that will be very uncomfortable for a lot of people. Same with resolving a conflict. But if you really want to transform a society, I think, and it's not perfect, when I look at South Africa, even though they didn't really deal with the inequities and in, in power of the economy and, and, and many other forms of poverty, but the South African agreement was truly a role model of how do you create an inclusive peace process and where there was a real, for many on the Africana side as well, a paradigm shift where they designed and wrote a constitution that really reflected a vision of a different society where everybody was equal before the law. Now, one could look back in South Africa today and say, well, of course, um, that's what it was about. But imagine if you know anything about American history, George Wallace, when he was governor of Alabama in the early 1960s, standing on the state capitol and saying, all people in my state, white and black, are the same, and our state constitution will reflect that, you would think that that was impossible. That was surreal. That could not have happened. Well, for that to happen in South Africa, when Rolf Meyer in particular, de Klerk and others in the early 90s said that, that was the equivalent. And so to transform a society requires clarity. But part, that clarity has to be built on a shared vision of the future that is rooted in a shared understanding of the past. And I will get to that uh, in a second. So what is it to develop a shared understanding of the past. Because to move forward, you have to ask yourself, are we just resolving a conflict or are we trying to transform the structures, the systems and the mindset that led us to this particular point of rupture? And I think recognizing rupture and then where do we go with this? And so a shared future requires a lot of discomfort. And I remember, and I wrote recently that I, and others got a lot of the South African leaders involved in the Northern Ireland peace process in the very early days. And when the Good Friday Agreement was signed in 1998, I called, or 97, I called up Rolf Meyer, who was the chief negotiator for the African government, uh, and Sarah Ramaphosa, who's now president, but had previously been their chief negotiator, because I had gotten them involved in the early days in Northern Ireland, and was very excited about the signing of the peace accords. And Rolf told me, well, don't get too excited. Cyril and I just talked and we had watched the parties from Northern Ireland go to the microphones after the signing of the agreement and gave completely different interpretations of the agreement they just signed. And they said, if they don't have a shared understanding of the nature of the conflict, what caused the conflict, then they really don't have a shared understanding of the future. And in a sense, for many Catholics, it was centuries of repression, of colonial oppression. But to many Protestants in Northern Ireland, it was a 30 year aggravated crime wave. I mean, these are profound different interpretations and they never went through the process of saying, can we at least have an understanding of how we got to this conflict, these troubles of the last 30 years. And you can imagine that's gonna be very difficult because deeply divided societies have competing narratives of the past which complicate the ability to both address the conflict and develop a shared vision. But here's something I think experience shows, and, and by the way, brain and behavioral science is reinforcing. Experience shows that you have to at least recognize the, adversary, the narratives of your adversary, to recognize that they're deeply important to them. They shape their identities. They shape the narratives that the community use in many cases to bond each other, of loss, of suffering of resistance or of protection or of fear. But to recognize them is not to endorse them. It's to see that they exist. And one of the biggest challenges we have in this country right now, particularly after the election, is for a lot of people who voted for the Democrat, that 74 million Americans voted for Donald Trump 
has made it difficult for a lot of people to imagine even engaging with them. How could they do that on some profound issues and values uh, and things of great emotional resonance? And the same for the other side. But, you know, as leaders like Monica McWilliams from Northern Ireland, who founded the Women's Coalition, or Ibrahim Rasul from South Africa, or many others from other countries say, you know, you make peace with your enemies. What options do we have? And what's also very important is what we learned, for example, in brain and behavioral science on the research of sacred values. So those things that are sacred to us, and I don't mean just in religious terms, things that are core to our identity as individuals, families, and communities, for example, the protection of a child or religious principles, or for a lot of Americans, the second amendment is held as a sacred value. When people try to get you to compromise those, and we now know this from research and, and functional magnetic resonant, resonant, is that people hold on to those uh, identities, those values more deeply and respond with aggression. But when you give a symbolic concession, literally what the research shows, when you say, I recognize that this is important to you. I recognize that in a sense, this is almost sacred to you. Doesn't mean you support those values or even agree with those values. And you may actually contest them and find them really deplorable, but to literally say, I see that they're important to you creates a cognitive shift where people are then prepared to negotiate. And that's an important insight, but also something very difficult to do in practice. And what's really interesting is I've engaged with some of the leaders I've met around the world over the last many months, and they're looking at the United States and many from the left, many from liberation movements. What they say is it's really important not to be tough on each other, as difficult as it is. So I, I just wanna move on to what are some of the key lessons from abroad? Dialogue is necessary. It is not easy, as I mentioned, when important values and emotions are at play. Here's another key thing. Lasting progress, transformative progress requires a belief and the capacity for others to change. We all wanna change. We all wanna recognize that change is uh, possible in our own lives, but it's difficult to imagine that people who are really across that strong partisan divide can change. We have to, and give them the tools and capacity to do that. Again, very difficult. I think of the moment when Nelson Mandela was coming out of prison in 1990 and a speechwriter for the African National Congress gave him a draft of the speech to the world. And Mandela had written, um, well, this had written in handwriting uh, as a, as a um, edit to the draft, F.W. de Klerk, who was then the president of apartheid South Africa, in a sense his jailer, is an honorable man. And the speechwriter said, Madiba, how, how do you say that? Your people have struggled and suffered. Apartheid has been brutal form of dictatorship and repression. And just the two of them alone, Mandela reached across and said, no, 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 it is up to him to disprove it. Think of that. He is saying F.W. de Klerk is an honorable man and it is up to him to disprove it. He literally took his moral and political capital and created a bridge, created in a sense a loan for him to cross over. Because he said, we will not achieve the transformative society we want unless we believe that people can change. And you know, another key lesson, not just from Mandela and many others, systems don't change on their own. They require human agency. And it gets back to this notion of change. Change is essential. Change is what we look for, positive change, particularly when you're at a point of rupture, when you're trying to resolve a conflict, you're trying to deal with your past, you're trying to deepen democracy, make it more representative and inclusive. And when you get to these moments of rupture, these powerful emotions become very difficult to overcome. And, you know, as I said earlier, I look overseas, not just for you know, uh, recommendations or talking points for the emotional strength that many of these individuals had in much worse situations to figure out how to move forward and make peace. The other thing I would say is language is critical. You know, they would say, use the word adversary, not enemy. Avoid binaries, either or, because they do feed into an us versus them mindset. 
And you know, the, the international community is full of powerful examples and models of the human capacity for change, but also the recognition that this work is profoundly difficult. So what would I want to make sure um, that we, uh, before I go on here, um, capture? To know that are you trying to resolve a conflict or are you trying to transform a conflict? Transformation requires clarity where it, in many cases, conflict resolution is about unity. To move forward, to create a shared vision of the future, you have to have some shared understanding of the past, which is not to say that you endorse, accept uh, narratives of others. And some narratives are very difficult. It doesn't mean all of them are legitimate. And that's a key point. It just means that you need to find a space for people to begin to change. And the other thing I wanna end with is you know, some insights from brain and behavioral science, which also resonate with some of these points I've made. Humans have a biological necessity to feel understood. That's really important. I know as a non-scientist, that was really quite mind blowing, um, so to speak. But we have a necessity to feel understood as we see ourselves. I mean, that is really, really key. What got me interested in brain and behavioral science was a retired neuroscientist many years ago when I was teaching a course here at a local university. I had Jerry Adams come in from Northern Ireland. And a student asked Jerry Adams, how do you sit across the table from somebody you may have tried to kill or they may have tried to kill you? And he paused and he said in his North Belfast accent, it's tough to make peace with a humiliated partner. And there was a retired neuroscientist sitting in the room. And he came up to me and said, you know, I've been sitting in these classes and I hear themes of humiliation or empathy or fear, but there's a lot of brain science behind that. And I remember thinking, what do you mean brain science? Because I knew the psychology literature or from what I've observed or experienced. And he said something so powerful. He said, speaking as a scientist, we are not rational beings with emotions. In fact, we're just the opposite. We're emotionally based beings who can only think rationally when we feel that our identities, as we see ourselves, are understood and valued by others. And the other thing I want to just end with is humans are exquisitely attuned to context. More and more research in the sciences, brain and behavioral science is showing that people can begin to literally empathize, to see themselves in others, to see people as individuals, and not as a collective who, who should be blamed by context, where their brain can access it often unconsciously and see themselves or their own mental models of the world are brought online in their brains. And the last thing is this notion of mental models. So it turns out as humans, we develop a mental model of the world literally between four and eight. It's like an internal GPS system that comes online tells us what's for us, what's not for us. Why are they that way? Why are we this way? And a lot of it gets shaped unconsciously. And it sort of sets us to go out in the world, but it can change. And when you think about what happens when you try to resolve a conflict or when you try to transform a conflict, it's also about updating not only the structures and systems of a society, but we have to keep in mind the mental models of people in that society. Because one of the things we see in this country is fear of change, status threat, identity threat. It's been weaponized, legitimate fear into grievance and now into a toxic form of polarization that others represent a threat to our core values. And the reality is, is that we, we need to understand not only the systems externally, but those psychological systems internally to get the change we want. So with that, I'm gonna end and I hope it wasn't too boring and I look forward to Q&A, thank you. I think you're on mute, Donna. Okay, there we go. I, I just said that was very powerful and I love the way you, obviously you know me, I love the way you combine the brain research with your experience working with parties um, all over the world. I just wanted, before I move into um, a q and A, I, I'd like to know if you could just say a little bit more about the la one of the last points you made that you said that humans are exquisitely attuned to context and that empathy 
requires context? Or could you say, give us an example of what that means? Sure. Um, I always put the caveat out. I'm not a scientist, but I spend a lot of time with scientists. Um, so it turns out that empathy is an overused and abused term in many fields, including ours. You just can't conjure it up um, out of a wish. Empathy can be used for good and for bad. But let me give you an example. Um, so a few years ago, I was giving a, speak at Notre Dame, a speech at Notre Dame. And I think everybody here will probably remember that image of that young Syrian Kurdish boy, Ali and Kurdi, who when his family was fleeing to go to Greece, the boat overturned and he drowned and he washed up on the shore of Turkey in the summer in August. And you saw this Turkish policeman holding his lifeless body and he's covered in, he's, you know, he's got shorts on, a shirt and sneakers. He could be any child, unfortunately, you know, caught up on Cape Cod or anywhere in the world. And it turns out that photo went around the world, went viral as an image. And I was showing that at this talk in Notre Dame on the nature of empathy and what does science tell us about the nature of empathy. Four photos from Syria that were on the front page above the fold, first page of the New York Times. And I wasn't doing it to be voyeuristic. One was uh, thousands of people sort of streaming out of Damascus at the beginning of the war. It looked like a Hollywood set. And I said, do people recognize this image? And most people said no, and about 200 people were there. Then the next one was an image of this young girl sitting on the back of a truck covered in dust and dirt and blood. Anybody recognize this image? No. Then the third image of a father holding his dead child. Again, all on the front page above the fold of the New York Times. Do, times. Do people recognize this image? No. But then I put that image up of that young boy I just mentioned, Ali and Curdy. Do you recognize this image? And every hand went up. And the question is, why do we recognize this image and not these? And one of the reasons is because of context. Literally, unconsciously, and in milliseconds, according to the scientist, our brains recognize that that could be our child, our family member mm -hmm. in Cape Cod, anywhere on planet Earth where there's a beach or a pond or a lake. There was nothing to suggest war or, or trauma. It wasn't like these others where people were steaming, streaming out of Aleppo or Damascus or, or bombed out buildings in the background, which is not only difficult for us to access, but from people in Syria at the time to access. And yet, seeing that image immediately access empathy in our brains because it was contextualized. This is something we need to know about. Mm -hmm. And so that's one example. And it's not, and you know, I can go on, but context can also be used for bad. So when people talk about extreme context or radical, I mean, I'm sorry, radical empathy, I said, it's already done. ISIS, you know, a lot of the ISIS recruits who were captured and asked, why did you join ISIS? Many would say they felt empathy for the suffering of fellow Sunnis. So the more we unpack the nature of our brains and the nature of a process like empathy, we then need to understand how that gets conjured up psychologically to recognize its use for good and also its use for bad. Wonderful, Tim. Thank you. That, that really helps. And let me get to some of the questions here, uh, which there are several. Um, let me see here. Well, the first one is people address the problems at surface. If you don't address it at root, it's going to pop up somewhere else. How do you address the conflicts at the root? Well, I, it goes to um, what I was saying is that root problems are where shared understanding comes online, right? Um, those root problems often are there because they've been there for a long period of time. Exclusion is a root cause of conflict. And in each different country, or conflict, there'll be different drivers of exclusion in that context. And that is a root problem. And as our friend Jose Maria Ghetto would say from Guatemala, he said, told me three decades ago, exclusion is a root cause of conflict around the world. And so in that case, you need to look and say, okay, what brought us to this point? Could it have been, you know, in the case of Bosnia, the collapse of Yugoslavia, but something else was generated there that brought on centuries of history and outrage and anger that galvanized people. 
In the case of Northern Ireland, it was centuries of discrimination and repression, certainly in this country. And so, you know, you do need to get to the root causes, but those root causes also require that shared understanding and also recognizing that exclusion is not often something that's the unfortunate reality of one community. Many people will have experienced exclusion, but then you can get into a bit of a competition of who is excluded or suffered more and how that gets managed uh, is gonna be really key. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tim. So here's, here's a question. What could a system with more than two parties do with the polarization issue? Um, you mean so now we have Democrats and Republicans that are polarized. So what if we had another party? What, how would that affect the dynamics? Well, I mean, it's a really, that's a really key question. I mean, I think polarization, while it's been sort of manifested in Democratic Republican identities, um, there's been that sort of sorting that's taken place in this country. It transcends those partisan identities as well. Um, which is really unfortunate and is what has deepened and worsened that. Um, when our researchers looked at independence, when it came to voting, independents chose one of those two party labels because in many cases they didn't have any other option. Um, you know, one of the things we look at in the research that our team is doing is the more you met, let people know about the misperceptions that take place, um, that people actually have more in common not only does it create, create a cognitive shift, it actually re increases warmth to the other side. Because one of the things that I learned from science is also how our brains evolved to be predictive and are constantly asking the question, what do other people think about me and us? And so, you know, this is one of the key things that we need to unpack. I mean, we in our country are sort of straightjacketed by this two-party monopoly. And that is deepening and making our polarization worse. Um, but I'm not sure if that really addresses it. That's a longer conversation about the nature of our polarization, but. Yeah, well, no, I think that's, that's great. Thank you, Tim. So what approaches uh, or insights can you provide relative to um, so-called non-negotiable issues? Well, I mean, that's a really key question in any process of what's non-negotiable. Um, you know, I would rec, so there are core values that are non-negotiable. Um, and, you know, one of the key lessons from various processes around the world is it's really important to strengthen the center. And I don't mean necessarily the moderate political center. I mean, the center of people who are willing to subscribe to democracy and democratic norms and want to make it more representative and who don't want to use violence and want to find a way through dialogue and engagement to work with each other, right? It's really figuring out how do you strengthen that center, that core, which means also recognizing who then gets marginalized and really recognizing, you know, that those people don't share core values. And I think you need to have a North Star. You know, in Northern Ireland, Catholics would say, you know, particularly who supported Sinn Féin and the IRA, what they always had consistently was a focus on a united Ireland and they would shift from using resistance to a political process, but they always had a North Star. And I think in any conflict resolution or transformation initiative that I worked on or you worked on, Donna, what was the North Star? It was not only peace and reconciliation, but deeper and greater and more representative democracy. Yeah, thank you, Tim. So Tim, um, what role do you think trauma plays in polarization? Well, I mean, trauma certainly plays a, a big role. Um, and, you know, it's really interesting. One of my colleagues, uh, Mike Nickenshook, has uh, been doing a lot of work with Syrian refugees and migrants in Jordan and elsewhere in Europe and Berlin. And I've learned a lot about the nature of trauma. And sort of like the word empathy, trauma is often overused and misused. And it's very contextualized. Um, but trauma is also very... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? It can burden people, even those who didn't directly experience it from engaging in reconciliation. So if you remember, Donna, you were involved in some of the work we did with Cuban Americans in Miami, mm -hmm. 
when the Obama administration was looking to open up um, or detente, or diplomatic relations with Cuba. Well, one of the issues in Miami is you had second and third generation children who were not born, born in Cuba, but were reluctant to engage with Cuba or the Cuban people on the island of Cuba because they felt a deep sense of loyalty to the suffering of their parents and grandparents. And the reality is that is a real dynamic. How do you pay, how do you pay respect, hom homage to somebody's family suffering? To let it be heard and be understood, um, in a sense, loosens the hold that even your own family's trauma has on you and those narratives have on them. Uh, but you know, there's a lot of work actually being done on the role of trauma in conflict. And I mean, in terms of could it extend conflict? Could it um, could conflict be mitigated? And there's still a lot of work that's being done on that. So I think that's probably the most I can say at this point. Yeah, no, it definitely plays a role. Um, could you give an example of conflict transformation as opposed to one of conflict resolution? Well, I mentioned earlier that um, I think that even though it's not perfect, the agreement in South Africa and the creation of a new constitutional system uh, represented conflict transformation. Um, and it's one of the reasons why the peace process and the agreement is held in South Africa. Um, the Dayton Peace Accords, you know, held because of a lot of international sort of support and pressure, but that was more resolving a conflict. It certainly didn't change, I think, the underlying dynamics of, of the Balkans um, and of the, the history pre preceding the, the conflict and, and what's existed since. In the case of Northern Ireland, it's a bit complicated. Um, you know, in many ways, uh, as I mentioned earlier, they didn't have a shared understanding of the nature of the conflict which has made reconciliation very difficult. But you do have the absence of violence, but there are threats of violence still in Northern Ireland. The peace walls remain, they haven't gone down. Communities are segregated, schooling is segregated. One thing that was transformative was they, they transformed their security service, the police force. It is now more representative. So there was an element of the conflict that you could say was transformed. Um, but I think it really depends on people looking at the conflict they're in, the division they're in, and asking, what is it we're trying to achieve? Is it the transformation or resolve this particular challenge? Yeah, thank you, Tim. Okay, so let's see. Um, let's see. This is uh, Donna. My question to you and Tim is, how could a healing process in the United States be based on recognizing wounds inflicted on human dignity and be centered around healing those wounds? I'll turn it, that's your question. Now you go ahead. I wanna hear what you have to say about that. Well, I've learned a lot from you on the theme of dignity. Um, I remember you said to me once that we recognize when our dignity is violated by others, but we don't necessarily recognize when we violate somebody else's dignity. And I think the same exists with like dehumanization. It's hard to really understand what it means. And we've done some research and others on the psychology of it, but we can all speak to when we think we've been dehumanized. Mm -hmm. It goes back to this notion of not only do we have a biological necessity to feel understood, but as we see ourselves and we immediately understand those things that have that deep emotional resonance, particularly in a, in a negative way. But what, how would you add to that? Well, I was just thinking um, about a conversation I had with Archbishop Desmond Tutu about just asking him, you know, what do you think it takes to heal these wounds to our dignity? I, I just wondered what he'd say. And he stopped for a minute and then he looked at me and he said, well, Donna, I think there's one key ingredient. He said, when people have been roughed up, they need acknowledgement for the suffering that they've endured. So mm -hmm. the key element of dignity, I think, and based on my, you know, my the insights from him and my conversation with Desmond Tutu, we human beings need the, those dignity wounds acknowledged. Um, and that's kind of like the starting point, I think, of, of the healing process, because then you know there's several steps after that. But if you want to open the door 
to whether, you know, to our polarization here in this country. I think, you know, you sat down, you said right from the beginning that we need to hear the stories of the other. You don't have to necessarily agree with them, but you, you, you know, you say, yes, I hear what you're saying. I acknowledge that this is important to you. So acknowledgement in my view is, is the key. All right, let me move on because we have several more. Um, let's see, Joshua Weiss. Okay, Tim, what are some of the best books you would recommend when it comes to psychology and conflict specifically? I've seen a lot of good articles, but not as many books. Mm. Um, well, you know, there are a number of books um, that I can recommend. Um, there's a new one that came out by a friend, uh, a colleague named Colette Rausch, that's uh, published at George Mason University through the Hoke Center for Reconciliation. And Colette Rausch, R-A-U-S-C-H, also has a great podcast on brain and behavioral science. Um, and I can't think of the name of her book right off the top of my head, but if you look it up, it's looking at brain and behavioral science and its connection to conflict and reconciliation and what we can learn. Um, but there are a number of books out there that have really looked at brain and behavioral science. You know, there's Thinking Fast and Slow by Kahneman and many others, but there are a few that have really tried to bring together insights from brain and behavioral science in this world of conflict and reconciliation. And then um, a friend of ours, Mari Fitzduff from Northern Ireland uh, did a publication I don't have the names in front of me, but I would look up Mari, M-A-R-I, Fit Stuff, and then Colette Rausch's most recent book, which I think is a, just a first edition and others to follow. But I think that's a really good resource. And also on our website of Beyond Conflict, we have a lot of other reports uh, and resources, including a report we did two years ago on decoding dehumanization and understanding the psychology of it as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's see. Given that polarization is exacerbated by social media, to what extent can regulation of content contribute to overcoming the, the demonization of the other? Well, that's a really key question. Um, I mean, that's a subject to a, a real expert on that coming in, Don, in the future. but. I'm sure a lot of people have have seen, if you haven't, the documentary, uh, I think it's called The so Social Network, um, and looking at the impact of Facebook and Twitter um, have had on political discourse and, and, and social discourse and, and deepening polarization. It's a real threat to democracy. And there's no doubt that a lot of these media platforms um, have really exacerbated uh, deepening identity-based polarization. And, you know, um, Somebody mentioned earlier the question about mental models. Um, and, you know, again, as a non scientist learning about how we create mental models of the world at a very young age, when we think of how do you get people to change, you know, how do you get people to be less racist or more empathetic or um, to make peace with their enemies or to imagine true dialogue with somebody across a big divide? I think it's always important to remember that people have, we all have as humans, a mental model of the world. Now, Rolf Meyer, who some of you may know or know of, who was one of the chief negotiators in the talks to end apartheid in South Africa, once told me that he grew up thinking as a white Africana that not only was apartheid good for white people, but for blacks. And I remember sitting back thinking 25 years ago, how the hell could you think that? How could you think that apartheid could have ever been good for people of color or blacks? in South Africa. And I realized rather than getting outraged and angry, he was not talking about how he was thinking at that time. He was describing how he went through a paradigm shift, how the more he got exposed in government to the reality of apartheid South Africa, the, male, the more it just challenged his basic notion of decency and good, and that the system he was brought up to defend was corrupt and had to change. And he described it as a paradigm shift, where he said to clerk, really didn't go through that. He had a, what he called a pragmatic shift. How do we cut the best deal? Which goes back to this notion of conflict resolution and conflict transformation. I would say that Rolf is a, a model of somebody working to transform a conflict 
where the clerk is a model of somebody trying to resolve a conflict. How do I cut the best deal for my community? How do I keep power? You know, game is up. We need to do a deal. Where Rolf and many others came to realize that the system he grew up in was morally corrupt, that it was built on superiority versus inferiority and had to change. And in a sense, the scientists would say that view that apartheid all the way through his mid thirties, early forties, his age was good, was a mental model that he began to shift. And I think recognizing that we all have these mental models and they also have to shift, but they shift in certain ways. And that's what science is illuminating. Yeah, thank God for neuroscience is all I can say. I think we'll have time for one more. Um, let's see. Um, okay, how much time do you factor into a peace process like the one in Northern Ireland in particular these days where time is such a, a scarce resource? How do you manage expectations about how much time this will require? Well, that's a really key question. I think it's one of the key questions. Uh, it's like, how much time does it take to develop wisdom as a human um, <laughs> or to see the reality of your own mistakes and ways? Um, I will say something quite uh, interesting. When I met Emile Bruneau and Rebecca Sachs, who are uh, neuroscientists, well, over a decade ago, the first question they asked me is, how long does it take to really create lasting change in individuals in your experience? And how do you know when you've achieved it? And I would say, well, you know, you sound like a donor. <laughs> Funders would always <laughs> ask the question, how do you know when you, you get the change you want? And I said, well, it takes time, increased contact, but the right type of contact gives the, creates the capacity for people to start seeing themselves in the experience of others right, that they say, wow, I, I get that now. I see how it resonates. You know, we don't have a word in compromise in our language, you know, that's required. And I said in Northern Ireland, we spent well over a decade and did about 30 initiatives. We did work in the Balkans, about 30 initiatives over a decade. And over time, as people got exposed to the experience of others overseas and brought it home, they started to have a shift. And what Emil and Rebecca said to me is, they thought that the, and I agree that the benefit of brain and behavioral science is if you understood the psychological processes and the neural mechanisms that come online to allow people to empathize with others, to connect with others, to recognize how dehumanization um, gets triggered, right? Or how it gets processed when it's triggered from the outside. You may be able to take a two year program and break it down to nine months. Mm -hmm. You may be able to take a, an encounter that creates lasting shift to a 10 minute intervention and where people have that cognitive shift in their brain. And, and you know, Emil's done some really important research on how do you overcome collective blame with Islamophobia in the West. And again, some of that uh, research is on our website or people want to follow up. But I think we're getting to a stage, the more we understand this three pound universe in our heads um, I think the more we'll be able to advance this work and be more efficient and more productive. Oh, Tim, I couldn't agree with you more. That's a, that's a wonderful way to end this, um, this presentation. You, you were so generous with your time and your wisdom and insights. And I know uh, on behalf of all of us, I just thank you so very much for this. And before we end, I want to tell everyone, you know, this is the Herbert C. Kelman seminar. Well, our beloved Herb, just turned 94 last week. And I wanna wish him um, a very, very happy birthday and many, many more. So thank you all again for, for being here with us today. And Tim, you're a rock star, what can I say? Well, thank you, Donna, and thanks, Herb, and, and thank all of you for joining me, and joining yeah. us. Yeah, all right. Until the next time, folks. <laughs>